You may have heard of a company called Model either in my previous video or just being around structural engineers. There you see they produce these amazing physical models that are not just plastic elements that click together. They use magnets. <laughs> and as we can see here now, why we need to build buildings for robustness. Just through a little pressure here, we had a catastrophic collapse. Now, I do need to have a little bit of a disclaimer here. You see, they did send me these models for free. However, they have no control of what I'm actually saying or any of the content in this video. It's just a product that I really love and love playing with, especially showing people that how structurals actually behave. And if you order now, you can click on my affiliate link in the below description and you can get a 10% discount. If you order before the 8th of December, it will probably arrive to you before Christmas. So it can be a Christmas gift under the Christmas tree. And what engineer wouldn't love to have this? But let's show some of the principles that we can show with a product as simple as this. So we've come back to a model like this. This allows us to show some simple principles of structural mechanics. What we can do is take out specific elements, but not have a catastrophic failure like we had in the past. So what does this mean? It means that not every member in this structure is super critical. So we can work out where we can reduce weight. So we can say something like this is not a life safety or a collapse risk, but more of a service and occupancy requirement. So it means that this one can be designed to its limit state. Now let's see if we can take out another one without a catastrophic failure. So again, this one, we can see it dropped down probably a little bit more. There's a little bit more critical, but it doesn't have that catastrophic failure that we saw in the first place. Let's see how much we can remove before we have that catastrophic failure. So what does this mean? It means that this member here is super critical because of the tension forces are coming up and over and down. So we got a little bit more robustness here where if we hit this one, we don't see that failure. Remove that one off. Just a light touch led to the catastrophic collapse. So we can tell which members are the most critical. So why is that? Because of sheer principles, we know that the peak load is trying to come to the supports. So it means that these members on each side support more load then the ones between it where you've almost got a zero is shear force. And the top actions for the flexural actions trying to come down and across is our critical element. Where if we move something over here, per se, this one is not gonna be really critical because it's not part of the main truss system by this. So this shows us where the critical elements in the structure are, where we need to size up so these ones need to be stronger than these ones. So we need to have more robustness as we never want to have these ones that fail is it can't have really one single element ahead of a catastrophic collapse in a big bridge like this. If you're interested in picking up one of these kits, you might as well use my affiliate link in the below description. I do get a small commission for it, but you also get a 10% discount. And if you order before the 20th of December, they'll throw in some additional extender rods. See, through these models, we can show and play about why certain elements are critical and where we need to watch out for in our structure. Let's even go to a simplified model such as this which even these structural mechanics can be shown. So we can see when we bend a structure like this, so we've got a fixed joint at the bottom, but a pin joint at the top as we don't have any fixity through here. So when we push it, it's only got single curvature. But if we add fixity through the top, through applying these fixed connections, so we can see we've got a lot stiffer structure here when we apply the force, but it's turning the system into an S-bend. And this column's a little bit stiff, but you can see the S forming, where if we remove that stiffness from there, it just bends in one way. So we can see the actions of how a portal frame can work. And again here, we've got the same principle. So if we push down at the top, we can see through the fixity, we're getting curvature back in the other direction. So it means that when we've got a fixed connection, this is actually helping the deflection of the beam through here. Where if we remove that fixity, if we push it down, we're not getting that S curvature in the columns. So the column fixity helps with that deflection and reducing the deflection in the system. And again, we've got a little bit of a cantilever here. Let's see what happens. We'll need to remove some of that fixity to actually show this behavior. We've got the column here. We see it bends up dramatically. So we can always see the outer edge of that curve is gonna be the tension face. As that has elongated, it's extended. So we can see where the tension forces are gonna be. While the inner surface has reduced. So we've got the compression forces on here. Again, tension forces at the bottom which lead to tension forces on the far face. So we can flow the load through the structure. But as there's no fixity in this column, this column is just acting like a pin support. It's not taking any of that rotation. And we can see at the end, the moment is just bending up with the system. Although there will be tension forces a little bit in the faces, we needed the fixity on the top to allow for the cantilever to come back. There's no real curvature there. Now, if we push the other way, we can see the back end bend up so if we push it down here, we can see the back end bowing up a little bit through the middle here. 
and a little bit of movement in this system. But if we remove that fixity, we can see more of that action. So there's no moment coming to this column. Do you see how the deflection has actually increased a lot through reducing the fixities in the column? Now we want to add continuity through the middle here to show how a three-span system will work with a cantilever. So we push down here through its three-span continuity, we can see what the deflector shape is going to be. It's down here, it goes back up and it goes back down. So the cantilever is going down through pushing on the one element. Or if we push here, we'll have the opposite effect. So we're bowing up here and the cantilever is going up. So what happens if we push down? We can see deflection here leads to bowing here. If we push up, it should be the reverse. Now, what happens if we add a little bit of fixity into the system? But what's probably going to happen, similar to what we were seeing before in that other model, was that fixity is going to make this point really rigid, so it's going to pull moment into the column and reduce the actions across the system. Now, what we can see through having fixity in the columns in the whole area, we can see how the different columns react. We can see how this one's dancing this way, while this other one is bowing the opposite direction. You can see when we press down, bending down. We look at the cannily reactions again. See, so we're getting bending in this column significantly through that fixity. So we're bowing up and we're getting movement in this column now. So we've got moment coming into this column, up across here, into this column. And it's likely leaving the back span slightly untouched as the moments are transferring primarily through this first column, slightly through this little column and through this back column as well. As this back column is less stiff because of the less moment fixity here, it means that the force is going down this central column. I've just the simple static mechanics through a model like this. So if you're trying to learn statics 101, a model like this will help you a lot as you can physically build them, see how they're behaving to see whether what your assumptions were doing are correct. All those first principles were done with Moller Kit 2. We'll move into one that's more about stability, which is a little bit more impressive. Now this is Moller Kit 1. So I built a fill model here as fully brace framed on all sides. We can see it's really rigid. So it shows you the principles about how we need to load up systems. So we've got a structure through here that's stable, but it's stable on all four sides. We've got bracing in all four directions. But we all know that for the basic mechanical principles that we only need support on three sides. So let's see what happens if we remove some of these bracing points. So now if we spin this model around, you'll see that we've only got three side supports on this element. Although it's softer, it's still relatively stiff. Now let's completely remove the other long side and add a sway frame action into there. We've got a lot more wobble in the system now. But what we need to do is brace it back up through a sway frame system. And this will show you why the preference over a sway frame versus a bracing frame in this type of structure. So we can see how much more flexible it is just through a slight touch. It doesn't make it unstable, but you can see we're relying more on the beams through here. We can see we're getting that curvature through the system as it rocks backwards and forwards. Even on all four sides, it's nowhere near as rigid as the same form as the cross section. So why is that? Well, a little bit of curvature, as we can see through here, can lead to a big deflection, where something like this is a tension tie. And if we extend it, we don't get much elongation or much movement. And it's that stiffness and rigidity through doing a direct force action as opposed to relying on those curvature tent sway frames. So wherever possible, it's more efficient to go with a cross bracing or shear ball system than it is in a brace frame solution. Now you can't always get a brace frame solution to work because it does require you to have areas that are blocked off where sway frame solutions such as this lets us have these big open areas where I can put my hand through and allowing for more cleaner access. So it really depends on what the architecture needs and just letting people know about what the impact is of changing from a brace frame to a sway frame solution and how the inefficiencies lead to bigger member sizes in your structure. For example, if we put a car up here with that frame solution we just had before, we can see it's got a lot more movement as it moves backwards and forwards. So again, we push it again and see it always moves off the edge. Now let's just add that bracing back in to see if the impact is the same with a brace solution only on one side. We're gonna add both sides in and see how much the stability of the structure has been improved by bracing it in one direction. So put the car back up, we'll do a similar force. We see there's a lot more rigidity in this system. So we can see through a simple model like this, the benefits of brace frame versus a sway frame. The sway frame leads to a lot more open areas where I can't actually stick my hand through now with the brace frame in there. We have this cross bracing in there, so it's not as open as what we had before, but it does have the added benefit of reducing the load in the structure. We don't have that curvature, meaning that we don't need to design these beams as strong for that bending action. And the structure is relatively stiffer, so it means that this car 
is more stable on top of the building. So underneath little actions, you're not going to see as much movement in there. Although the movement may be moved up through the structure faster through the rigidity, there is a lot more additional savings through that rigidity and the efficiencies that we have seen. So we can see the impact on things such as earthquakes, wind loads, you will feel a lot more in that structure. Where sway frame solution may actually help with some of those vibrations when you rock it backwards and forwards initially, but you'll see a lot more movement in the long run as it's not dampened out nearly as much. The forces in the base transfer a lot quickly through the structure, but there's a lot less movement in the structure itself. This is, this is arguably my favorite one of the bunch. And then this is Moller Kit 3. And you can see through this, it has a lot of additional elements in it. And it's more than just your static and gravity forces. It has tensile structures in it. Tensile structures have been something that's always fascinated me in the past. We can see the way the loads actually go into the system. Even cable state bridges can be modeled with such a kit as a molo. We can see through this fascinating bridge here about how systems actually work. If we remove certain elements like that, we can see how just a single tension cable can affect the overall stability of design such as a bridge. We put it back into place, perfectly stable. We remove that one element and it has a catastrophic failure. We can see the tension cables coming up and through. And through a little bit of movement, we can see how the structure actually moves and behaves and how we can make the structure dance just through in either increasing or decreasing the tension forces. This also allows us to show the most efficient shape for a structure. So if we had a load that was point loaded in three locations, if we did the same thing, flipped it upside down, this would be quite stable as a gravity force as all the forces are be taken in compression as opposed to tension that they are here. Where if we remove one element through here, Although it sags down, we've changed that bending moment diagram they had before. So we can show the behavior of tension stage structures. So this is just a simple bending moment diagram, similar to what we had before. So we've got a two point load structure here. See the bending moment goes up until the point, it stays the same level all the way through. It comes back up the other end. We add that structure back in. Now we've got a three pointed system. So the moment's peaking in the middle. We go back to that robustness clause that we had back at the start. Which elements is the most critical? So we can see that we can remove this one here, not have a catastrophic failure. So it's not the end of the world if that one's just designed to minimum capacity. We remove this one here. Again, same principle. We don't see a catastrophic failure through removing that one element. But if we remove this guy, we lose the whole structure. And likewise, this cable is the other critical one. As we can see, it's spanning from left to right. Remove that one area. We've lost the whole tension in the system. So the whole system is now sagging down. The bridge is only really standing up near its own weight. It's something that would need to be designed for. Now we've got our stability back in the system. So it allows us to show which elements we need to design for critically, which are the ones that we have to carefully consider. And if you're interested about how structures actually behave, I've got a simple principle that you probably didn't know that is true about structural engineering. If you're interested in supporting the channel further, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube member or a Patreon member. I'll just like to give a quick shout out to one of my newest YouTube members, Ryder. Without the support of you and my other YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.